Well, why don't you stand if you're ready to worship the Lord? Welcome in Bethesda House of Mercy. Father, we're here for you. We're here to worship your name, give you honor and praise, Lord. You're worthy in this place. Is he worthy? Yeah. Oh, Jesus, we are here. We're here for you. We've gathered in this place to honor you, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Oh, Jesus, we are here, we're here for you. of your hands let your praises rise open your hearts loose the song inside oh let us rejoice let us magnify his name oh Jesus we are here
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want you to think about just for a minute what it is we're singing about. I want you to know what we're singing about here is a kingdom message. What we're singing here about is what we're to be about when it comes to the kingdom of God. Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his rightness. And then all these things will be added to you. The one thing I need is Jesus. The one thing I need is Jesus. The one thing that we need is Jesus. And then guess what? When we go after him, when we're seeking him, when we're moving toward him, then he adds to us everything else. So that you and I aren't out here seeking things, plural, we're seeking Him. Here, we're seeking the one thing that we need. Jesus. Jesus. And when you seek Him, man, guess what? Everything else falls right into place. I'm after Jesus this morning, aren't you? As we sing this this morning, listen, don't let it just be words that's coming out of your mouth. Man, say, Lord, I want this to be my heart. I want this to be in my, in my heart. I want this to be what you want. I want to be after you. And listen, as we start to do this, just watch what Jesus does.
10 seconds, just say it out, how faithful he's been in your life. Come on, just speak his faithfulness in the room. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just say it out. Just say it out. Press in this morning. Press past feeling and emotion. Right into his presence.
a flash of light break it through we know who is lost he crossed eternity the king with life was on the moon for in a dark cold tomb we are lost He's worthy, give him praise in the place. We give you praise. Amen. Continue to worship and praise the Lord. He is good. Amen. He is good. As our ushers get ready to serve this morning, uh, you might need to bring some baskets with you, please. The Lord is good, amen. Draw near to Him this morning as we are fixed to honor Him. It's not just, we know, it's something that we take lightly as we get ready to honor Him. We've heard, we've already heard, the Lord is faithful. And if you're walking up right before Him, you've experienced that. And if you're not walking upright, you've experienced that. Because he has been faithful to me when I wasn't faithful. Hindsight's 2020, and I can always look back. For he 
is faithful regardless. But draw near to him this morning as we get ready to honor him with the tithe and the alms and our offerings. Offering is on your free will. Examine yourself this morning. Where is my attitude? Where is my attitude in giving? Scripture talks about work. We've heard quite a bit about that yesterday, even before some of us. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes said we should enjoy our work. And I believe that it says delight in that. a gift from the Lord. Your job is a gift. Now you may not look at it like that. You may look at it as drudgery. Oh, i got to get up and go to work and man, the weekend's gone. If you look at it as I get to and examine that as God give you that job you have. God give you that for a reason. So we can have the right attitude and can experience joy should love those kind of things. I think we love Jesus, but I like what I do. Now, there's days that are good and days that are not so good, but I like what I do. The Colossians tells us to do our best, right? Now, you, you examine your heart right now. Do you do your best on your job? Do you take extra breaks? Now, some of these guys have worked for going to the restroom at 15 minutes to 12 or 15 minutes to 4. I know those those, those old tricks. Like I say, I've been there, hey, just killing time. Okay, I'll speed it up. I'll get off at 4. I'll take a little extra break here, run to the restroom. Lunch is almost here. I'll run to the restroom. Father, we thank you this morning for your goodness and your grace to us. We thank you for each one's here this morning. We're, we're just delighted to be here in your presence and, and see what unfolds this morning, an awesome time of worship, and, and I believe we just have great things in store for the rest of the service that, that will help us to just uh, enjoy the afternoon, God, because we've been together worshiping you. God, may each one here experience your faithfulness and your goodness, God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Church, praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. If you won't praise me, I'll cause the rocks to cry out, the Lord said. Shout unto the God with a voice of triumph. Amen. Praise the Lord. Man, I tell you what, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Yesterday, men's 
gathering was great. I mean, the Lord was there. We worshiped God, and we had some um, fantastic word spoken to us. Every man from Bethesda here that got to go or decided to go or, or came, you know what I'm talking about. You were blessed. And then we had a, a, a great lunch. Thank you, Wendy and Laura, those that pitched in and helped out. Bethesda is a serving group, and we are blessed to give. God bless you for. I said we're blessed to give. Bethesda provided the lunch for the men yesterday. Some 80 men were here. We hosted the men's conference here for the state. And you know what? We don't do it grudgingly or we don't do it out of necessity, but we do it as cheerful givers. The elders of this church are determined that we cannot outgive God and that God will take what we sow to the wind and we will reap the whirlwind. Amen? We give God the glory for it. I want you to know that out on the table, there are sign-ups for the special groups that will be happening starting June the 1st. One of those groups is Financial Peace. Another one of those groups is Intimate Encounters. In that two groups... There's a decision to make. Financial peace, marriage. Financial peace, marriage. If, if your marriage is good or better, financial peace. If your marriage is in the ditch, More important than you having financial peace is having peace in your home. Come on, somebody shout. I'm going to tell you what. I'm going to tell you what. When Street and I didn't know whether we were going to be able to eat the next day or not, we still had a good time. We've been there. We've done that. But I'm going to tell you what. You can have all the money in the world. But if you don't have peace right here, it does you no good. And so you have to discern financial peace, intimate encounters. Financial peace is going to be the easier class. That's why we got 14 people signed up for financial peace. It's the easier class. Intimate encounters, though, is a challenge and a work. So that was just a boost. Please get out there and sign up if you have not and you need a little bit of help. Sometimes sometimes your marriage is not in a ditch. It just needs a little shot in the arm. Hello? When Sri and I went to Intimate Encounters thing in Georgia, we thought everything was grand and glorious. And, and it, it was grand and glorious. But in that Intimate Encounters time that weekend, we found out there was just a few little things there that we needed to deal with. We thought we were going there for you. To bring that back here so we would have another tool in the, in the, in the backpack for Bethesda. And we wound up getting uh, uh, charged up. And Sri was thankful because I, I got just a little bit better after that. She, you know, they straightened me out and got just a hair better. Because I want you to know I'm a work in progress. Amen. So... Please sign up for that. Also outside, there is a Bethesda informational class. If you have never been in the Bethesda informational class or it's been a long, 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 long time, you need to repeat that. You need to come in there and learn about what we're doing and what we're about. Also, there is a uh, going to be a sign-up sheet out there two weeks after that. Uh, in June, um, there will be a gifts class. How many of you want to know what God's got for you? Yeah. 
I wonder if we went around the whole church, if we would all be able to identify what God's gifted us to do in the kingdom. Sign up for that. God will bless you. You know what? I'm thankful today because I got my big brother here visiting with us. They used to call him when I was running around, Big Joe. Big Joe. I looked up to my brother when I was younger, even though he was very mean to me. Seven years older than I am, he took a lot of stuff out on me. But I survived, and I love him anyway. But I'm so glad that he's here. It's probably, I think, the first time maybe he's been in service with us, but we're glad. We're not, we know it's not going to be the last, so we thank God. Appreciate that. Today, I want you all to stay after church here. As, as the message is finished, we're going to do something that I just thank God for, and that is Impact School of Ministry has a graduation ceremony. Yeah. yeah. We're going to be recognizing some people who are getting their bachelor's degree as well as some who are getting their master's degree have, who have worked hard. And we appreciate them. We want you to stay and support that and, and uh, share with the joy that they have of finishing out. And, and uh, we, uh, we appreciate all of you, so stay and be a part of that. Right now, though, we're going to have meet and greet. So everybody rise up, go around, high five, fist bump, hug somebody's neck, and let them know you're glad they're here.
that he healed your heart and changed your name and now you're forever free come on let's give him one more time thank you God you're worthy this morning Lord you're so worthy you may have a seat in the presence of the Lord 
It's a, it's a joy to be here. If you're looking up going, I don't know who that guy is. I've been here a few times, but uh, my name is Chris Romano. I am the president of Vision Christian Bible College. We are the, uh, the overseeing college for Impact School of Ministry here. And so I'm delighted to be here uh, primarily to, you know, assist with the graduation, um, but also because I just like hanging out with Jerry and Sarita. I had nothing to do with the offering. I just want you to know that. <laughs> yeah. I almost didn't get up this morning, but that's a whole, that's a whole other story. We won't even get into that. But, um, yeah, it's a joy to be here. You know, I, I'm in a lot of churches, and some churches you're in, it's just church. And then other churches you're in, and it's, it's the family of God. And so, uh, so I can tell you, I, I feel like I'm a part of this family. Um, and getting up here is not, uh, I don't feel like I'm a guest speaker or nothing like that. So I um, feel like I have a word for you guys. I'm really excited. I bring greetings not only from the college, uh, from my family, uh, my wife, who will be married 24 years. Um, yeah, talk about the faithfulness of God. But I think I need to go to that intimate encounters class again. Like, I think so. Like, maybe I'll come back for the summer and take that. What do you think? Because I want to go the distance, man. I want to do 40, 50, 60, you know. I'm chasing after Methuselah, man, 900 and some odd years. But, yeah. My wife is, is certainly the better half. And we've, uh, we've actually been together over 30 years because we were junior high school sweethearts and high school sweethearts and college sweethearts. And she's still my sweetheart. So, yeah. We got five children, um, four of, we, we call them the original, the OGs. Um, the youngest of which graduated high school Friday night, and so we've graduated four. Um, the, the oldest two are married with children, so I'm a grandfather of three. Yeah, so it's a full, it's a full quiver. Five children, three grandchildren, just getting started, and uh, God is so good, man. He's so good. I loved what, I don't know, I think it, I think it was Sean, I'm not sure. I was so caught up in worship at different points, but just thinking about the faithfulness of God. I was actually on a walk the other day. And uh, just praying and, and just enjoying his presence. And, and the Lord had stopped me and said to me, I want you to look back at the last 25 years. I've been walking with him. It's now a quarter century, 25 years with the Lord. Um, and he said, I want you to look back at, at your history with me. And I was like, okay. And I began to do that. Just went back to the, to the day that I was born again and just began to recollect on some of those milestone moments, some of those, those moments where you felt like I was defeated, I felt like I wanted to quit, um, I don't know if I'm the only person in here who's been there, but just look back at, at your history, you know, some of the monuments that were established where God showed himself so powerfully, so faithfully, revealed himself, and, um, and at the end of it, I can, I can honestly tell you that there was never a point in the record, there isn't a point in the record, where I can say that God was not faithful. And it was, so, it was so significant for me because, you know, I, I believe, and I'm going to get into this here in a moment, I believe that the word calls us to continue to look far beyond where we are right now. It doesn't mean that we forsake the, the importance of, of knowing, having self-awareness, knowing where God has us, knowing what God is doing. Those are all important things. But kingdom people are forward-thinking people. It's not a spiritual gift to say that if you're a kingdom person, you're a person who should possess vision, the ability to see, see beyond where you are. And so there's places that I know God's called us to, there's things God wants us to do, but it was significant for me in that moment to really capture once again how faithful God has been. The Bible says to declare his faithfulness. Not only in the assembly, but you need to, and I was on a road um, in, in, my, in my development, and uh, and I just began to declare the faithfulness of God. And I was hoping neighbors heard me and people thought I was a little crazy. And I mean, everybody in Orlando is crazy, so it's, it's pretty much the way it is. But, but I would challenge you today. I mean, you, you know, you were already challenged to do this. You know, just kind of consider the faithfulness of God in your life. But declare it. Declare the faithfulness of God. Sing, sing your own song to the Lord. You, you know, you don't need Sean and Michaela and the rest of the band. You, just begin to sing your own song in the Lord. All right? No matter how you sound, because it sounds good, it's a sweet-smelling sound to him, no matter what you sound like, trust me, I know. 
There's a reason why I'm not up, on, up there with the band singing songs, all right? But God is pleased when you sing your song and you declare his faithfulness. So, amen, amen. amen. Well, I want to, um, I really feel like I got a word for you guys for this church. And, and I want to share with you a, a couple of foundational scriptures and then we'll kind of take off and see what God is going to do from there. Um, there there's, a, there's, a, there's something that actually God gave me this morning that I'm going to kind of uh, lead in with in a moment. But I want to read the scriptures first and then I'll get to that here in a second. Let's read together. Let's read just two places. Psalm 133, verses 1 through 3, and then Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, which is going to be uh, from a paraphrased uh, translation in the message. So first, let's read Psalm 133. It's a, it's a small little psalm. How many of psalms are songs? They're songs. Isn't it interesting how they weren't meant to be read? They were meant to be sang? I mean, we read them now, but these were never, they were, they were songs. Like, think about your favorite song, right? And, and think about if you only read it. It wasn't meant to be read, right. even though it has lyrics. It was meant to be sung. Well, all the psalms are songs. They were meant to be, to be sung. And so this is a short little psalm, short little song uh, that David wrote. And uh, so it's three verses, one of, the, one of the shorter ones. We're going to read it here right now together, and then we'll jump on over to Proverbs and, and, and read that one verse there. So let's read Psalm 133, verse 1, 2, and 3. It says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his, of his garments. Verse 3, it is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of, of Zion. If you don't know Hermon, you don't know that, uh, that particular um, mountain was actually the largest mountain range in all of Israel. So it's, it's, it's very important that he's speaking about Hermon there. He says, like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing and life forevermore. All right, let's jump over to Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. Again, I'm going to be reading it from the message paraphrase. Uh, other more common translations, you'll see it say something like, uh, where there's no vision or there's no revelation, people cast off restraint. Uh, but I love the way this reads this. It's actually been an important uh, sort of theme in, in, in my life in recent days. But Proverbs 29 verse 18 says this. It says, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. Anybody ever stumble all over yourself? If people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But... When they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. Isn't that good? I want to talk to you this morning about attending to God's dream. Attending to God's dream. I want to pray for you guys first. Father, I love this place so much, but I know you love it more. And I know that you know intimately every person in this place, every man, every woman, and every young person. You know everything that they're going through. You know what they've been through. You know what they're about to go through. You know where... You want to take them and their families individually, vocationally, ministry-wise. And I pray your supernatural blessing upon this house. I pray your supernatural, abundant, overflowing, more than enough blessing upon every person in this place. And I pray, God, that as this word begins to come forth, that it would begin to really cultivate a heart that desires to dream for you. The desire is to dream, and to dream big. The desire, God, to want to see the boundaries moved, the boundaries extended, the boundaries so, so, so far beyond anything that they've possibly imagined, Lord. Like what happens when we actually dream, where impossibilities become possible. And things, Lord, that we could have never, ever imagined, Lord, happen in a moment. And so I thank you, God, for the faithfulness of this house, the faithfulness of its leadership, and I pray, God, that you would just move this morning, move, Holy Spirit, move in a powerful way. Let it not be a sermon, let it not be a word, let it be something that leaves a profound mark and impact upon every heart here. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. 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 I'm a guy who just doesn't... Like, I don't remember my dreams. I don't know if, if you're like that. Um, anybody like that, just, just to kind of make me feel a little bit better here this morning? A few of you? Isn't it frustrating? Like, when you know you've had a dream, but you can't remember it. 
Or if you can, you only remember like little bits and pieces of it. Yeah, that's me all the time. There's actually a few dreams. I'm not going to share them because they're real personal, but there's a few dreams I've had that are reoccurring. It happened kind of over and over and over again. Uh, it seems like it's playing the same movie, uh, you know, on, on repeat. Um, but I don't, I, my wife is the exact opposite. My wife remembers every detail about her dream. She'll wake up in the morning and she'll sit there for like the next 45 minutes and tell me every, every aspect of the dream from colors to like, you know, words and, and, and she knows where she is. She, everybody there. And I'm like, how do you do that? Like, how? How do you do that? I, you know? Anybody like that in here? Like, you're like that? You're like, you guys are smiling. Michaela's like that. A few of you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I mean, I envy you guys. I know we're not supposed to envy, but I envy you guys who can do that. My wife's very proficient in that aspect. But there's something really powerful about dreams. I believe God speaks to us in dreams. How many believe God speaks to you in dreams and visions? The dreams and vision type house. Yeah, I do too. Yeah, I believe he does that. I believe that one of the reasons why he, he can do that is because, you know, we're, we're half asleep or we're asleep. You know, we're kind of in our subconscious state. We don't get in the way. Our will, our intellect, we don't get in the way, and God can just download things in our spirit, and, right? But I'm not here actually to talk to you about that kind of dream in this morning. I'm here to talk to you about the kind of dreams that God wants us to have as his children. And like I said, this, I, I, I realize there, there's aspects of it that can be spiritual gifts and that kind of thing. Jerry talked about gifting. Um, but I, I really, truly, I have this conviction, every person in this place, if you are part of the family of God, God wants you and even expects you to dream, and to dream big. Like, if the way you dream, if you're like, you yeah, know, I dream, brother, if you, the way you dream isn't in proportion to how big God actually is, you're not dreaming big enough. We serve the God who said out of his own mouth, he said, I am the God who does exceedingly, abundantly above, immeasurably more than you can ask or think. That should shift some things. That should change the, the game when it comes to how big we dream. And it's not just a, 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 a pastor or a leadership's job to dream, especially in the house of God. We should all bring our dreams to the table. And I believe that when we do that and there's, and there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a unity, God, God just does some unusual things. We've been actually seeing it happen in, in recent months. God's been doing unusual things in America. Actually, in this part of, part of, the, of the country, he's doing some unusual things. I mean, we're sitting in central Florida kind of looking around going, wow, that's pretty special. I know lots of people uh, from, from our area who've been traveling to this area, uh, even some parts in the north. I know in Ohio they had that big uh, revival, right? Was it Ohio? Indiana? Asbury, right. Where, is that in Ohio? Where is that? Why didn't you guys shout me down? I mean, I told Jerry when I, when I came into Elizabethtown, like, I, I feel like I'm in the paradise. I feel, like the, I feel the presence of God as soon as I cross the line. You should have shouted me down. I'm not offended. Don't worry about it. I'm fallible. He's not. Anyway. Look at this scripture with me. This is actually not what we started with, but I felt like God gave me this this morning for you guys. Psalm 126, so it's not a, not a far travel from where we were. Psalm 126 and verse 1. I want to read verse 1 and 2 with you guys. Jerry, I really feel like this is, this is for, for you guys. Um, so I really want you to consider it. But Psalm 126 verse 1 says this. It says, when the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. It says, then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. And they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. So people were taking notice at what God had done for a redeemed people. So here it is. Really short context. All right, I like context. Really short context. This, this harkens back to a time when the children of Israel were in captivity at a place called Babylon. Seven decades. That's a long time. That's a lifetime for us. Seven decades they're in, they're in, they're in slavery once again because of their, their insistence to rebel and, and, and worship other gods. So they're in captivity. They're in bondage, right? And uh, they're in exile. And after 70 years, God begins to free them and release them. 
And they're, this is, this, so this is speaking about this experience where upon being freed, upon being released, again, they began to dream again. They began to, to laugh again. I think, I think there's some people in here who might benefit from just laughing again. Just laughing again. I know that in times past it has kind of gone to certain extremes, whatever, but there's something about being spiritual and and having joy. And I know joy is not necessarily always laughing, but there's something powerful. And I'm just looking at it, some of you just need to laugh. Some of you just need to smile. Right? We, and and we, we had four different songs that gave us lots of reasons to do that. I mean, he picked me up, turned me around, placed my feet on solid ground. Come on, Sean. Might need to get up and do that song again, just to get some people to laugh and smile and enjoy. But this is speaking about a historical event. We're talking about an ongoing event in our lives, a spiritual freedom, a spiritual deliverance, from cap- the captivity of sin. Where your life was completely turned upside down. You went from exile to liberty. You went from death to resurrection. That was your life. It's not just about Jesus. His death is your death, his resurrection is your resurrection. When you were saved and you said yes to Jesus, you were raised from the grave. You were raised from the dead. You were not who you used to be. Amen? Come on, somebody. I preach a lot better and a lot faster if you shout back at me. They told me this was a Pentecostal church, a charismatic church, so that's why I came this morning. It says, we were like those who dream. And and I really believe that God has given this church a a new dream. I really believe that God has given this church fresh vision. And it's, it's not just an overarching one. I really believe that he's given some of you dreams that have kind of been sort of like dormant for a while. And he's bringing them back to life. He's bringing them back to life. And some of the evidence of that is you're just going to start laughing again. Those things that have, and look, I understand life can get difficult sometimes. The challenges that we face, right, they're hard. Jesus said that. In this world, you will have, you have trouble, right? But what? Be of good cheer. And I think, I think that's, that's an when you can walk in that, when you can walk in spite of life being hard, in spite of being, you know, when, when, you can, when, you can, when you can live your life in a sense of, uh, in the midst of tribulation, in the midst of trials, in the midst of uncertainty, and you can still shout for joy, and you can still laugh, and you can still smile, and you can still celebrate in somebody else's success, and you can still high-five the person standing next to you, or the person at the, in, in, in your office, in the cubicle, and you can, you can still say, my God is good, my God is faithful. His testimony is sure in my life. There's something powerful about that. And I just believe God's given us some dreams here in this place. But what I talked to you about this morning is, is and we have to, and I don't, I'm not contradicting myself, but I think it's really important that as we dream and as we consider this, that we have to be careful about not crossing that line and having our dreams supersede God's dreams. I stand here before you as someone who's made that mistake one too many times. For the majority of my, of my walk with the Lord, I was one of those Acts 9 type things. I was walking one way, God knocked me off my horse, and I said, God, okay, yes, let's do this. And it was the actual fast and furious, like from that point on, 25 years, let's go. Mach 10, let's do this. Elizabeth, Kentucky, let's do it. Hudson, New York, let's do it. Orlando, Florida, let's do it. You know, the nations, let's go. Whatever you want. Where do you want me to serve? Okay, give me a broom. Give me a plunger. Give me a towel. Yeah. Whatever it is, you want me to teach? I'll teach. You want me to preach? I'll preach. You want me to sit and be silent? I'll sit and be silent. It's just been, that's, I don't take credit for it. That's just what happened to me. That's just, that's just what happened to me. But there's been times in 25 years of I've been working for the Lord instead of allowing the Lord to work through me. There's times when I've been dreaming so big, like, God, look at this. You know, come join me in this. Instead of saying, wait, stop, be still, know that he's God and pursue. God, what is your dream? What is your dream for me? What is your dream for my life? What is your dream for my family? What's your dream for my marriage? I'm a work in progress too, Jer. I get it. I get it. I got a long way to go. 
But thank God I'm not where I used to be. Amen? That's something that would be good to say to tomorrow morning when you wake up. Monday mornings are just hit different, don't they? Monday mornings hit different? Yeah. We're, we're preaching a series now in our church called Made for Mondays. I hate it. I said, don't let me preach that series. I'll preach the next series. We're preaching on the kingdom next series. That, that's my series. Monday mornings and me, just, we just struggle, man. I mean, I have an extra cup of coffee on Monday just because it's Monday. We just wrestle it out, fight it out, man. I don't know. But, right? Isn't it true Like the majority of uh, pastors resign on Monday morning, every Monday morning? Is that true? And not you. I mean, you are just the model of <laughs> integrity. And... Come on. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not where I used to be. I'm saying that tomorrow. I'm just confessing that over and over. I am not where, I, I actually won't be where I used to be because I'll be, in home, I'll be home tomorrow. But anyway, all right, here we go. <laughs> Our dreams synchronizing with God's dream. Our dreams aligning properly with God's dream. Seeking him first, his kingdom, for his kingdom dream. And what I'm going to share with you here in Psalm 133 is what God's dream is. I totally believe this is God's macro dream. It doesn't take a rocket scientist, it doesn't take a Bible scholar or an expert to look in the scriptures. As you walk through the scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, Genesis to maps, as you begin to walk through it and you recognize, somebody caught that out there, Freddie caught that, maps, maps is the last thing you see in your Bible, you got it. Anyway, okay, you good, Freddie? Okay, man. All right. Just check it. Let me make sure Freddie's okay. This is God's macro dream. Psalm 133. How good and how pleasant it is when brethren, that's the body of Christ, that's the family of God, when we dwell together in unity. That's God's dream. Now, I want to I I just throw out a, a disclaimer here because I know, this happened to la uh, the last time I was here too. I felt like God gave me a word and... I'm like, God, they're, they're living this out. He said, do it anyway. They know he's go to another level. Same thing as I was praying. I believe that this word is for you, but I believe you're, you're, you're walking in a lot of this, but it needs to go to another level. There's higher heights and deeper depths. Come on, somebody. There's some people, you just need to hop on board with this. You're not there yet. Others are, but this has got to go to the next place. And so as we come back to Psalm 133, I want to encourage you to come back to, this is God's, God's dream. David's singing a song, and I, and I love when the Bible does this. I love it so much. I love prophecy. How many like prophecy? Okay. And a lot of the Psalms are prophetic. They're, they're not just singing about moments in time. They are prophetic. And David, who, who wore a lot of hats in the Bible, he was a king, he actually put on the priest ephod at one point. He was also extremely prophetic, extremely prophetic. And what he's doing here, whether he knew it or not, is he's prophesying about a time that would come when the Holy Spirit would be poured out upon the earth. So what's kind of interesting is when David's singing about here wasn't actually possible in that moment that he was living because the Holy Spirit hadn't been poured out yet. So when we read this, we read how good, how pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. We kind of get like this. It's sort of been watered down. It'd be like, isn't it great that we're all in church together? Yeah. How good and how pleasant it is when we go to church. I'm not saying it's not, but that's not what this psalm is talking about. It's not just talking about people coming once, once a week for a couple of hours. That is not the unity that, that David is singing about here. He's also not speaking about physical proximity. So husbands and wives, I mean, we, we've already established the fact that, you know, we need an intimate encounter, right, that class, right? Husbands and wives, you don't have unity just because you live in the same house. You don't have unity because you have the same last name. My wife and I don't have unity just because we've been married for 20, 24 years. We don't, it, it doesn't just happen. It's not just an automatic Something that David is thinking about here is so beyond, actually, it cannot be manufactured by humans. And I'm going I'm to show you how we can know this. And this is good when you're analyzing. How do we know if something is prophetic in the Old Testament or in the Psalms in particular? How can we know? Well, I want to give you a few, a few very clear keys here. There's obviously others. But if we look at Psalm 133, you're going to put up on the screen. Go back to verse 1. Can you go back to verse 1? Actually, I'm sorry. Go back to verse 2. 
So David speaks about this unity, and then he gives, he gives a couple of illustrations to kind of explain what this unity is like. He's describing it, and he says this. He says, it is like the precious oil upon the head running down upon the beard, the beard of Aaron. Aaron was the high priest. Now, you correct my theology on this, Jer, but oil in the Old Testament is a type and it's a symbol of the Spirit's activity in the life of the covenant people. So when you see oil, or anointing oil in particular, okay, you're reading it, say you're reading it in Leviticus. Nobody reads Leviticus. You should, okay? Or you're reading it in some place in the Old Testament. You're reading it in Exodus, right, when they're talking about giving all the instructions about it. You're seeing the word anointing or oil. Y yes, that, 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 was, that was certainly an actual substance, but what God is trying to point your eyes to is something that's going to take place beyond that, and that's the Holy Spirit. Okay, God, what are you doing here? So he says, it's like the precious oil upon the head, running down the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. Now, I want all my mathematicians to tell me this. How many times do you see the phrase running down here? Say it. Twice. Thank you, Sarita. Right? You're such a good student, Sarita. Best teachers are the best students, right? Twice, right? Okay, now watch this. Next verse. Verse 3. He says, it's also like the dew of Hermon. Now, dew is a terrible translation, even though all the translations, the modern translations use it. Dew is actually better translated as light rain or mist. Okay, here's another lesson. Just as oil is a type and symbol of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, so is rain. So is rain. So clearly, God is tracking on something here. When we talk about oil and we talk about light rain, he's clearly tra talking about something that is an indicator that's divine in nature. Okay, now watch this. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. Now, he doesn't use the phrase running down, but if I'm a thinking, if I'm a thinking man, running down and descending have the same, have the same meaning, right? Okay, so, so if, we, if we do the math, twice in verse 2, how many in verse 3? Does, does the phrase running or descending, how many times? One. Very good. You're an excellent student. That's why you sit up front, right? Yeah. Okay, so, so here, here's the real, the real challenging thing. Two plus one equals what? Three. Equals three. Right, you're a great class. Okay. Another clue. Three is the number of God. Time and time again, three is the number of God. It's the number of the Godhead, right? On the third day, Jesus rose again. You see it all throughout the scriptures. Three is an indicator of something that, that is, again, divine in nature. Listen, to keep it very simple, what David is singing about here is not humanly attainable. It has to come from God. It has to. That's why he says this unity that I'm, that I'm singing about is something that is divine in nature. And it's something, and I love, the, I love the imagery here. It's something that's sourced from above and runs down. It's something that, that has its inception in, in, in heaven, but then has to translate to the earth. That's the imagery. And that's the will of God. The will of God, Jesus said this in, 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 uh, in the Lord's Prayer. He said, the will of God is on earth as, as it is in heaven. Listen, I don't, have to, I don't have to preach this. There's unity in heaven. I know, I, I know you guys didn't like the math part. I get it. Okay, I understand that. I don't like school. All right? I get that. All right? You're going back to like 10th grade. Actually, you're going back to like preschool. But anyway. But come on, hang with me. On earth as it is in heaven, that's the will of God. That's what this is all about. There's perfect unity in heaven. There's perfect unity that exists between Father, Son, and Spirit. They are inseparable. They are in lockstep. They are, I mean, when, 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 when Father who devised the plan of redemption in eternity past d decided that, that man was going to be redeemed by himself, by the giving of his son, there, there was no wondering on the, on the part of, of Jesus. There was no wondering about it because there's such unity. And that unity is God's dream for our lives. We're talking about something so beyond the, the, even the concept 
uh, of unity. It's something more powerful. It's something more deep. It's something more robust. God is, is, is so zealous about establishing a people in the midst of unity. And I love the language here. He says, how good and how pleasant it is when my brethren dwell. That word dwell is tabernacle language. Come on, you just did a seminar on tabernacle. That is tabernacle language. It pictures a people living in a tent, relating as family, in the midst of the presence of God, sharing their lives, devoting themselves to the flourishing and the common good of everybody there. That's, that's what he's speaking about here. And he's using all these little clue, uh, clues to, 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 to push us to this place to realize you cannot have unity without God. And, and furthermore, you can't have unity without a move of God, a move of God. And that's why I, I would really encourage the leaders in here, you need to pray for a move of God every time the people assemble. A move of God, a move of his spirit. Put your plans all at his feet and say, God, whatever it is you want to do. Yeah, whoever's going to preach, yeah, they studied and they prepared and they, and they poured their heart out before you. That's great. That's awesome. You should do that. But ultimately, if the Holy Spirit says, stop, I want to do something. Stop, I want to speak. Stop, I want to reveal. I want to do something different. I want to do something that might, might, be, might, might not be over at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. I, I want to do something. Maybe, maybe we don't even want to start at 10 o'clock. is what he's speaking about a move of god i really believe that ultimately what he what what he's speaking about in these in these in these uh these metaphors are a move of god and that's again kingdom stuff kingdom stuff's always in motion it's never static it's always motion motion descending running down constantly you might sleep god never sleeps you might pause god never pauses right that's, that's how he is. That's how the spirit is. When, when, I believe when, you, when we're sleeping, God's just working. He's just, getting, he's just getting going. He's just getting started. And so we got a lot, there's a lot going on in this passage. And, and I just find it interesting that it's speaking about a moment in history that David couldn't even actually attain. Because the spirit had come among them in that era. The spirit wasn't in them. And at the same time as, as God is pointing our attention forward, he's also hearkening us back to a time that once was in the Garden of Eden. And I want you to go there in your minds with me. We're not going to go there in the path of the scripture. It, it's, it's, fair, it's, it's, it's fairly explicit. Genesis chapter 1 and 2, what's going on in the Garden of Eden. Not only the creation of all things, the creation of man, the commissioning of man, all that's happening, Right? I can sum up what's going on in the garden by one word. And that word, I'm going to have him put him on the screen. That word, one word, is a Hebrew word. It's called shalom. It's called shalom. When you, pe- when you read through Genesis 1 and 2, what you're really reading about is shalom. Now, for us, we, we like things very, very quick, easy, and simple, don't we, as Americans? We don't like things complicated. I can go through a million of examples. That's why we like smartphones so much. You could download, you know, whatever, whatever you need, just like that, right? Anybody like to stand in co- coffee line, lot lines for coffee? I don't. I want it now, right? You too? You too? Just now, right? We want our food now. We don't like to wait. If you like to wait, you're super spiritual. You're other human, you're otherworldly. You're, you're something different. You're an alien, okay? <laughs> it's the truth, Okay? Likewise, when we, when we want to understand what something means, we want to just kind of reduce it to the basic. To the, to sim- and I like, I like it simple, I do. But the fact of the matter is the Hebrew language is not like that. When you want to know a Hebrew word, it's even different than Greek. Greek typically has like, you know, a, a basic foundational meaning. Hebrew is not like that. He, he, Hebrew words are like, you know, like a fig tree. It's just like branches all over the place. And so, like, you might say, well, I know what shalom means. Shalom means peace. Yeah. But it's so much more than that. Shalom is the Garden of Eden. And if you could, if you could, if I can use, you know, uh, language that sort of fits, if you could sort of uproot the meaning of the word shalom, this is what you're going to come up with. It means wholeness. It means completeness. It means fullness. 
I'm going to keep going. It means harmony. It means beauty. It means synchronization. It means order. It means community. It means connection. My favorite word to describe it is connection. I love that. I'll come back to that in a second. It means oneness. It means unity. So when you hear, like, if you watch the Chosen, Chosen fans out there, you got to play the Chosen? Yeah, love the Chosen. They'll be saying that, like, you know, when they greet somebody, which is a customary Hebrew greeting, they'll, shalom, all right? Or if they want to get the double blessing, shalom, shalom, right? They'll, they'll do that, okay? And, and in a sense, they're, they're saying, peace upon you, peace be with you, peace over your home. In a sense, they're saying that. They are. I'm not, dis I'm not discounting that. But there, there, there's something more that they're, that they're implying when they say that. Every word I just, I just described to you that really personifies what, sh what shalom is, that's what they're speaking over one another. Shalom is when everything is working properly. Man, there's an anointing on that. I like when everything works properly. I like when things work the way they're supposed to work, Jerry. I, I just like when things are just, I like order, you know? I remember those teenage years when we had four crazy teenagers, and it just seemed like there was no order. It was all chaos. I do miss some of those moments, but I like order, and so does God. God's a God of order. God's a God in his kingdom. Everything works right. And I love when you, when you I, love, I love to dream about and use my imagination on what the garden was like, because what the garden was like was shalom. What the garden was like was, first of all, you have God in the beginning, God, right? God is just shalom within himself. Someone said one time, I read this, that God is one, is a benevolent king. God is two, is an intimate partnership. But God is three, is a divine community. And within that community, there's perfect shalom. In that community, there's perfect harmony. In that community, no one's competing against each other. In that community is perfect, perfect love, like 1 John 4 type stuff. Perfect love. The type of love that casts out fear, the type of love that casts out devils, the type of love that does the impossible. In that community, Father, Son, and Spirit, perfect. And that's, so, so you have that in the garden, right? And then God starts creating things. And, and just, just check me on this. Is any part of creation arguing with God? Any part? Sun, moon, stars, trees, none of it, none None of it's like rebelling against God. Like, I don't want to be the sun. I want to be the moon. Like, is any of it going on? No, there's no, none of that, right? Nothing at all? Uh-uh. Right? So you have connection between God within himself. You have connection between God and creation. Then God makes man. He says, let us make man in our own image, in our likeness. Perfect. In the garden, in the garden. Original creation. It's just perfect connections connection everything's connecting god and man human and human adam and eve before that snake comes on the scene right perfect connection perfect everything flawlessly just working the way it should that's shalom guys that's what god is calling us to i'm way ahead of myself here but here's the thing are we there yet It's a high calling because it's personal and it's corporate it starts personal it's you have to you have to do a lot of that assessment of your own self like Lord show me the areas that just aren't working properly and you're not the issue I am <laughs> show me those issues show me those places that needs your sanctifying work Show me those places where there, there's unholiness that needs holiness. Show me those places that, are un, that need righteousness. Show me those places that are unfaithful that need, right? So it starts with you, but then, then it begins to extend beyond that into, into the, this community, into this place, where we all have to kind of look, look, look around. It's not just one or two or five or ten. It's all of us. And, and not pointing the finger, but how can I be part of the solution? How can I be part of, of the redemptive solution to, to, to what's going on here? To, to nudge us closer to shalom. Because here's the thing that David didn't have. We have an unfair advantage. We have the Holy Spirit. 
So what, what, what this song is singing about, how good, how pleasant it is, when brethren dwell together, this is actually attainable for us. This is possible. We live in a kingdom that's now. We live in a kingdom that's at hand. We live in a kingdom where all things are possible. This is possible now. I'm excited about this. Right? Think about how helpless David, David was in a moment. He could, he could only see it from afar. He could only go back in the annals of history and look at the garden and go, oh, man, Adam, you blew it, bro. You blew it. Yeah. And this is not going to be accomplished easy because we have an enemy who hates Shalom. He hates it. Everything we just described about Shalom, you could, you could basically just flip it on its head and that's the kingdom of darkness. The kingdom of darkness, the foundation of it is discord, division. I'm going to use the word loosely, divorce, to mean separated, breaking apart, something God has established. That's the enemy. We get a metaphor of that in John 10. The enemy exists to what? Kill, steal, destroy. That's the kingdom of darkness. He accomplishes his assignment in Genesis chapter 3. We know that. Shalom gets shattered. Shalom gets shattered. Everything that was connected, disconnected. God and man separated. He banishes man outside the garden. Man and wife, once connected, once inseparable unity, now blame shifting. It was the serpent. It was the woman you gave me. It was the, right? No one wants to own anything. Everybody's pointing the finger. But you have, you have, to, you have to remember, not a few sentences earlier, everything was connected. So the enemy's not going to just, you know, he, and I believe he's, he's, he comes to church every Sunday. I do. I believe he checks us out. He's looking for a little loophole. I mean, if he checked out Jesus, guys, come on. <laughs> And if he said, yeah, you know, you defeated me with a word, you know, one day, the Bible says that he would return at an opportune time. He, he's relentless. He's a defeated foe under my feet, but he doesn't stop. And he wants to discourage and disrupt the movement, the kingdom movement of shalom in a person's life and in a church. It's so important that you're aware of that. The Bible says, do not be ignorant of the enemy's devices. Right? And so we, so, so, we, so we see everything that was connected. One, and I want you to make a note, if you note takers are out there. Genesis chapter 7 and verse 11 gives a vivid, vivid statement. Because Adam and Eve, it's just the beginning. It's a very, very slippery slope to Cain and Abel. It's a very slippery slope to Genesis chapter 5, and God's going, what is going on? There's a really frightening verse where God's like, I don't even know why I made man. Things are just spiraling out of control. Shalom is shattered. Genesis chapter 7 and verse 11, God determines he's going to flood the earth. And the Bible says that upon the, upon the, upon the flood being, being released, that literally, Genesis 7 11, that the very foundations of the earth are breaking apart so the floodwaters would come. And that imagery is very, very purposeful on the part of Moses who wrote this. Everything that God had established from a creation standpoint is now breaking apart. It's the opposite of shalom. It's disconnecting. It's separating. It's, you get what I'm saying? And the effects, of course, are, you know, just run, reverberate throughout the rest of, of, of the history of God's people until Jesus comes. Until Jesus comes. So let me fast, uh, just speed this up a little bit here. <clears throat> David is singing about a kingdom ideal. And it's such a different narrative than Shalom being shattered. He's calling the people of God back to Shalom. He's calling the people back. And I love this, 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 this other word. I love words. And I'm always looking for the words. And the words, another word is the word together. In Psalm 133, the Bible says, how good and how pleasant it is when brethren dwell together. Together. I love that word, together. You can find this word, I don't know if it's in every translation, I haven't looked at every translation on this, but you can find this word throughout the scriptures as well. 
And when you do, man, highlight it, circle it. It's such a powerful word. I know it seems like, well, yeah. I've lived a lot, I'm 47, I've lived a lot of my life where I wasn't committed together. Maybe on the surface, but not in my heart. I agree with Paul, who said in Romans chapter 7, in my flesh dwells no good thing. My flesh is a thief and a robber, selfish, self-centered. It wants what it wants. Again, probably the only one in here. Gotta make me feel a little bit better, guys. Come on. Smile at me. Laugh again, right? Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and I have been so convicted by this in, in, in recent years where I just, whatever, whatever I do from this point forward, I just want to do it together. I just want, I want to devote my life to together. With my wife, with my family, with my ministry friends, I just want to do together. Because man, I agree with the psalmist. It's good and it's pleasant when you do it together. Can I show you this one verse here that just, I think, sums it up really quick? Uh, Acts chapter 3, verse 1, if you want to turn there. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. I love when the Bible is so clear, when God is so clear on what he's trying to convey to us. In Acts chapter 3, verse 1, this is a, I, I encourage you to read the whole chapter. It's, it's such a phenomenal story. But in Acts chapter 3, verse 1, these are two of the, 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 the chief apostles, uh, the chief disciples of Jesus, Peter and John. And, and um, obviously Jesus had ascended by this point. And, uh, and they're, they're just doing what good Christians do. They're going to prayer. They're going to pray. That's all they do. Just going to prayer meeting. But watch, watch, watch the language here. Ready? Verse 1. Now Peter and John went up. What's it say? Yeah. Now you can read that just like, you know. Peter was lonely. John was his friend. Peter was just looking for someone to go to Starbucks with. I don't know. All right? Or you could read into this a little bit more. And I'm encouraging you to do that because this is not an isolated verse. I'm using this verse to show you there's a spirit behind what he's saying here. They went up. How'd they go up? Together. How'd they go up? Together. They went up together. Now, when you read the rest of the story... What the Bible is going to say is something incredible happens when you go in this spirit. When you have the same heart, and you have the same mind, and you have the same desires, and you have the same goals, and no one's trying to be somebody. Like, I know Peter's the big mouth here, which is clear when you read this. He's kind of the, the, the spokesperson, right? He's the first one to... to to open up his mouth, but, but Peter did not have the spirit here of like saying, look, this is my show, John, like back off. That's not going on here. They went up together, and you know what happens? A miracle happens. A man who had been lame for decades from his, I, I think it's remote, from his mother's womb, is healed, is freed, is saved, is delivered, Right? And I know that ultimately it's the Holy Spirit who does that, lest you think you heal somebody. But, I'm, but it's, it's, it's clear. Read the Bible. There's a reason why an unusual miracle happened, because they had the spirit of together. They went up together. And when God sees that you have that spirit, and not every church does, and not every Christian does. But when God sees you have that spirit, unusual things happen. Marriages are restored. Hearts are healed. Families are revived. Communities are changed. Cities are altered. Even states are shifted. I know people who are prophesying this right now. And they're saying that America's done with. God's done with America. I've heard it with my own, my own ears. God's done with America. They had their opportunity. He's lifting his hand a, 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 a blessing off. 
I'm not about that life. Because you know what, Sean? I live in America. Now, I'm a kingdom man, but I'm an American citizen. This is my country. And I don't think God's law has forgotten America. I, I know the condition of America. You do too. I don't think God's done with America. I think God wants to bring revival to America. Absolutely do. But we're going to need some people who are going to cultivate this heart of together. And this heart of shalom. In this heart of, I don't care who gets the glory, as long as it's Jesus. I don't care who gets the credit, as long as his name, his beautiful, precious, powerful name, gets all of the recognition. And so when I read my Bible, yeah, it's for my personal edification, but when I read my Bible, I'm thinking about somebody else. God, what's the word that I need today to give to somebody else? I need a word. I need a word. I got to go to church. I need a word. Yeah, I need a word too. But you know what? The word isn't just for me. The word is for you. And when you have that spirit of together, whether it's Bible study, whether it's prayer. I've actually slapped some people before, Jerry. Not like in a you know, violent way. but We go to prayer meetings and I hear people pray. And listen, when, when, you, when you're learning how to pray, I mean, I remember the first time I had to pray in public. I was so scared. I mean, the only, the only thing I knew how to pray was the Our Father. I was a Catholic boy for 20, 21 and a half years. I, I saw only, or the Hail Mary. There was only prayers I know. Hey, hey, would you mind pray, praying? I'm like, oh my gosh. And the only thing I was asked to do was pray for the food. I was scared to death. So if, and I want to say, so if you're, depending on where you are in your walk, you got, you, got to, you, got to, you got to crawl before you walk. You got to walk before you run. I, I get it. But as you grow in the Lord, and I know there's some people in here, you, you, you are, you're, you're, you're full, fully grown, fully mature men and women of God. Your prayer should not be about you. I'm not saying don't pray for things in your life. I don't mean that. Right? You can clean that up. You, you're, the, you're the pastor. I'm not talking. But how much of your prayer is somebody else focused? How much of your prayer is actual intercession? I mean, you rub shoulders every day with people who are dying right now, dying and going to hell. And you're like, God, I need a new shirt from Kohl's. Like, I really do. I really do. I'm sick and tired of eating peanut butter and jelly and ham and cheese every day. Lord, would you send revival? So we can have some steak, some ribeye, some pork loin. What's that stuff you have? Pecan. What is it? Pecania. Lord, send the fire and send the rain. Like. And maybe not people dying going to hell, but there are people who are just floundering instead of flourishing. People who are sinking. There's people in this, in this room that are in that state. Let me ask you this. Do you know everybody's name in here? Today would be a good day to do that. That's what family does. I mean, you might have certain relationships that are closer with other, but I mean, y'all should know each other. together oil running down mist running down the mountains favor of God running down one of the things I love about it and I, I, saw, I saw those kids just jumping and giving God I love that I love that so much this is a generational blessing Psalm 133 the imagery of running down means it's all-encompassing. It's not just supposed to hit one generation. It starts in one generation. It just begins to infiltrate every, every generation. It's an it's a, it's a everybody. Hey, this is, the invitation is open. Come and experience shalom. Come and experience this unity. Come and experience this oneness. Come and experience this connection. Let me close with this. Can you put that picture up for me? Yeah, I love this picture. I love this picture. 
That's a massive tree right there. Freddie's smiling. He's from California. He's like, yeah. I don't know if that's a mighty redwood or a sequoia. I don't know what that is, but that's a massive tree. They say these trees can actually grow up to 300 feet high. And their width can get up to 25, 30 feet wide. Look at, look at, look at the proximity of that, of that young lady in that picture. That is a massive tree, right? It doesn't take much. You just walk up the tree and you're like, whew, that's impressive, baby. You know what's even more impressive? What you can't see. What you can't see. Because here's what you can't see. The roots of that tree can actually go out 50 to 100 feet from its, from its trunk. You know what you can't see? This tree actually was grown, formed, and shaped in tribes, in community, in relationship, in connection to the trees that are around it. Redwood trees literally thrive because of their connection. And their roots, as they go out, they actually feed each other. They, they, they pass on nutrients to the other trees. They stabilize. They secure. They bring safety. They bring strength to the other trees. So in that part, that, that, that part of our country, when the, when the mighty rin, winds roar, guess what? These things don't move. Not because they're anything in and of themselves but because they're joined together with other trees. This is the church. This is your church. Your strength and your stability. Listen, I know this church has good history, but you have more future than you have history. But your future is dependent upon your commitment to how good and how pleasant it is when men and women and young people are connected at the source. When your roots just kind of interlace and interlock and you don't know where one starts and the other one finishes and it's just, there's just such a connect, a seamless connection. This is what God is calling us to. This is what God is calling you to. If you're part of this church, you are, you, are, you are being called to a greater commitment to shalom than you ever have before. Are you hearing me? David wasn't singing about his time. He was singing about your time. He was singing about this church. He was singing about this era. How committed are you? Because it doesn't matter. I know we're, 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 we're talking about expanding. We're talking about building. Look, that's all great. It's all necessary. It's kingdom stuff here. But the best part of this church are the parts that nobody will ever see. But you guys know. You guys know how you love each other, how you're there for each other. You have the spirit of together. When someone needs something, it's not one or two people running, it's hundreds running. That's what you're being called to. This is what biblical kingdom living is. Just in case you didn't know. I thought I'd come down to Florida to tell you. Amen? Love and appreciate you guys. Praise the Lord. Let those that have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit Amen. is saying to the church. Those that have eyes to see, let them see what the Lord is speaking to the church. God is doing something with us and in us, in us first and then with us, that if we're not careful, we will miss out on and not see. 
He's doing it. He's doing it right now. God is pulling the veil off and revealing to us what thus saith the word of the Lord and what true kingdom dynamics really are. God is doing something new in Bethesda. I hope and pray that you can feel and see it yourself and you're saying, not without me. Not without me. Amen. Please be patient with us as we get ready for this graduation. Let's give honor. Let's, let's, let's have honor for those who have committed themselves and who are graduating. And let's be a little patient as we go to get ready. Um, and then please stay with us as we do the ceremony. Thank you. You know, when you talk about Impact School of Ministry, 
and Impact Christian Academy, they've been birthed from dreams, from visions. These things are visions and dreams that I have personally had for over 20 some odd years. Sometimes it was on the verge of happening. Sometimes we're close. But yet, it seemed as though still so far away. But yet, I never gave up on the fact that I believed in my time that God was going to allow me to be a part of something that was going to help to produce a generation of people, of young people, who could be taught the things of God and grow up experiencing the kingdom of God. And I believe that God was going to let me be a part of a school of ministry where the saints of God could be equipped and prepared for the work and the labor that God would have them do. I believed in equipping. I, I believed in pouring into others. I believed that God was going to use us. I, I wanted an avenue where people could get in a setting in which the kingdom of God could be emphasized. I wanted them to be able to get an education in the scripture, an equipping in the scripture, something that would help them to be equipped to do the work of the ministry. And something that they could get accredited for, a diploma for. Now we all know that this robe today does not really mean anything in the long run. We know that my piece of paper that I have in my office, my diploma that I have in my office that says a master's degree on it, ultimately in and of itself does not equip me or make me something. We're not about necessarily the document other than it is an accomplishment. It does not qualify me for any more than I had already been doing. But yet it speaks volumes out into this world, out to other people's lives, that we have prepared ourselves in a greater measure for what it is that God wants to do in our lives. And for that I'm thankful. And I want you to know the school, I believe, is just beginning. I believe this next year I prophesy, I declare for Impact Christian Academy that we will have 50 students. I prophesy and I declare that this is just the beginning for Impact School of Ministry. That we are going to launch out into the deep. That we're going to launch out across the state of Kentucky. That we're going to launch out in other states that will be joining us online in the midst of that very class. Doing work with us. Hearing what's going on through Impact School of Ministry associated with Vision Christian Bible College and Seminary. That we will begin to help equip people across the land. I believe that a lot of you who may not be interested in getting a degree, you're going to be interested in classes, though, and you can come in and audit those classes, take those classes for certificates, in which you are preparing yourself for more. We have some of those people here in this room today. Jessica, Jessica Barone, Barron, she, she took those courses. She wrote those papers to get a certificate. She has two years' worth of certificates classes that she's taken, sacrificed her time, dedicated her time to do that so that she can learn more about what God has for her life so that she can be equipped. You can be a part of that. You can do that. You can also, you can also be a part when August comes of a new semester in which you are learning and becoming more equipped, where you also could, if you wanted to, get a bachelor's degree, where you also could move forward and get a master's degree in theology or ministry. I want you to know I feel privileged today to have been able, at 61 years old, to be able to receive my master's degree. It took me 40 some odd years to get there, but I thank God that the Lord helped me to fulfill a dream from the time I was 18 years old 
to fulfill a dream of accomplishing that in my life because I always wanted to. Today we're celebrating with these who are trying to fulfill their dream, but also at the same time their desire, their hunger, their thirst is to be equipped for the work of the ministry until they can become a mature believer in Christ. Isn't that what we're all after? That's what we're all after. And so as we begin to call these out, I want you to know I am so proud of these individuals who are among the first ones that we have had. Last year, some of these got their bachelor's degree. This year, they were able to finish up and get their master's degree. And I am thankful for them. They have worked hard. And every single person that is going to walk out here came through this with excellence. Every single one of them are all almost 4.0 A students. Every single one of them wrote papers that I set in my office in awe of how they were able to rehearse back to us what they had learned in that class. I sat there sometimes amazed. I'm also thankful for our young people. We have two young men, young men, who are in our Impact School of Ministry, Caden Hughes and Kyler um, Carter have labored for two years now uh, under the scrutiny of our um, torturing them as they did their schoolwork at home, but also did their schoolwork for the ministry and also attended and fulfilled their roles and things they were doing in the church. I thank God for them. You don't find many 16, 17-year-old kids, young people, that are willing to dedicate themselves like that. And I thank God for parents who see in their kids something and say, you know what, I will invest in this, and I will help them through it. They have fought the fight, and I'm praising God because next year they're going to finish the course. Amen? We will graduate two individuals next year with bachelor's degrees that are just now finishing their high school. Yeah. And we weren't easy on them either. But today we recognize these who have first the ones we're going to recognize will be those who are receiving their bachelor's degree. And the first person that we would like to come forward is Nate Kirk. <laughs> Almost two and a half years ago, Nate came to Bethesda needing Jesus. And... Nate dedicated his life, the Holy Spirit got a hold of Nate, Nate dedicated his life, and from there, there's been no stop. I know that because Nate lives in my house. Sometimes Nate pops out, he sits with us, he'll watch a show with us, he'll do something with us, well, whatever. But big majority of the time, Nate is in his room, studying, reading, praying, seeking the Lord, struggling, battling, writing his papers. But yet in every bit of it, all through the whole thing, he never complained, he never griped, he never bellyached. He was thrilled that he was a part of it. And I appreciate Nate today, and it's a privilege and honor that he is receiving his bachelor's degree from Impact Christian Academy through Vision Christian Bible College and Seminary. Thanks, Nate. This next person I want to recognize, of course, is special to me because I've watched her labor. I've watched her use her apostolic gift to help to start things. I've, I've watched her as she has labored and served beyond. I believe it was beyond. And I thank God for her. She's my wife, but I still want to recognize her. Sarita Westerfield, she is receiving her 
bachelor's degree, and then she has also finished this semester the credits that were needed to have her master's degree. And so we want her to come forward, and we recognize her today. This semester was hard for Sarita. We felt like it was important for her to get this because of the Christian Academy. And uh, I talked to her and I said, Sarita, I said, you, you, you can, with everything else you've got, because she had some secular, she had life experience and things of that nature, but a lot of discipleship classes she had taught and taken, things that she had helped develop, things that she helped do. But I told her it's important because here at our school, even if they qualified to receive a master's degree without even going to the school because of past stuff, we're requi we're, we're requi we are requiring everyone to have at least fret 15 credit hours in the class, which meant she had to write five papers, term papers, in order to fulfill it. And doing the school, it was hard for her to do that, but she labored her way through it, even though a few times I think she might have been late on getting the paper in, but <laughs> she, she persevered, and uh, I thank the Lord for Sarita, and Sarita, congratulations for your accomplishments and all of your hard work. I'm so proud of this next person that's going to come out. He is somebody who had already been to secular college and received a degree. And uh, Anthony, work, Anthony Brown works in um, management for different, has worked for different stores, but lots and lots of hours he had to put in. Lots and lots of hard work and having to deal with people on a day-to-day -day basis, but yet he was faithful and labored hard. And I, I can't even tell you the times that I read his term papers and I thought to myself, my goodness, man, this guy has a gift. I wish I could write like that. And I'm proud of him, and Anthony is receiving his master's degree. <clears throat> God bless you. This next person that's going to be coming out, when I talked to him about the school, told me, I'm sick of school. I've been in more classes than you know what to do with. And I said, but oh, this is different. This is something that you love. You're going to study something you love. You're going to study the word. And he swallowed his feelings at the moment and said, all right, here I go. And he dug in deep. And I thank the Lord because he is receiving his master's degree today with excellence. Pastor Fred Jones. When we were working on the last class for his bachelor's degree, Pastor Fred made a comment. I'm going to tell on him today. Pastor Fred made a comment in class. I'm done. I don't want to do any more. And, and I, I thought to myself, I ought to just get up and slap you. I don't know how, I don't know the same day, I don't know if it's the same day, maybe the next day or whatever, he came to my house and he said, Pastor, I want to apologize to you. And I'm like, what for? What'd you do? He said, I shouldn't have said that the other day. Now listen, it takes a lot for somebody to apologize, not even when you're not gone after for it. He comes, he says, I want to apologize for you because that was a wrong attitude to have. And I want you to know, I will be there for my master's degree. And here he is, 
receiving today with honors his master's degree. And I, I love you, brother, and I appreciate you. This next person that we're going to have come out, she always says this, I just don't know how I'm going to do this. I just don't know how I'm going to make this work. Or, or, pastor, I'm going to try, but I don't know for sure if I'm going to be able to, I'm doing my best. Please overlook this pastor. But if you would read her papers. You say 10, she t she does 12. You say 10, she does 15. You got to tell her 10 means 10. I don't have time to read a book. She just got she's just so full. And she writes so well and if you watch her up here, she's the scribe. She has almost every sermon that she's ever said in scribed out. And she can tell you what was said for all the years, all 12 years, every time she was in here. She has everything that I've said written out. She is faithful, works probably more hours than anybody that we have in the church, but yet she still went through this and got her master's degree. Kimberly Gibson. Not just did she get her, ba her master's degree, but she got it with honors. I mean, she, she has a um, 4.0 average, and she worked hard. And trust me, if you could read the papers, you probably would never want to write one yourself. I, I remember one day I, I put out something that she wrote just as an example of how to do this, how to structure your paper. How to, and I wasn't trying to point her out and put everybody else down, but it was just what it needed to be. And I... I thank God for her and all the labor that she's done, and, and praise the Lord, Kimberly, you can say, I did it. Amen. This next person has been taking classes through, had taken classes through Liberty University and had been working hard. Not even seeking after a degree, a degree, but just getting certificates from them, but yet doing all the hard labor. I can remember him talking to me sometimes about the papers he was writing and what was required of him. And, and I thought, brother, you're not getting any credit for that? And so I talked to him. He, he came into the school, and he worked hard with excellence. And Andrew Kenny is today receiving his master's degree. Brother, we thank you for all your hard work and labor. And I know God's got great things in store. As you go now and teach what God has given to you, you're going to freely give it away. God bless you. This next individual, I want to recognize, I appreciate all of his hard work. Because what he did in order to be standing here today, receiving his master's degree, he would not have been able to be here this soon. But while we were having our classes on Tuesday night and Thursday night, he was doing with me an extra class throughout this time in order that he might be able to graduate so that he could be a part of helping to teach and instruct in the school going forward. He worked hard, dedicated himself, and it showed up in his work. I'm proud of him and I appreciate all that he's done, even, even the times when he was grumbling a little bit because he was having to write two papers at one time. But I love him, I appreciate him. Um, Pastor Sean Kirk.
you always want your sons and your daughters to go not just alongside of you, but beyond you. You want them, you want them to show you up. You want them to do better than you. And so Sean's even mouthed off to me because he's not just content with being alongside of me with a master's degree. He's kind of talking about possibly uh, getting his Ph.D., which I told him, go for it. I'm not. (laughs) 42 more credit hours and a lot more work. Thank you. Go for it. I'll be cheering you on, brother. But let's give all these a hand today. Thank you, Pastor Chris. I'm sorry, Dr. Chris Romano. We were joking around with him because that robe that he has is for people who have PhDs as well as the president of the school. It weighs about 450 pounds, and three of the guys had to put it on him back there in the back. Not really, just kidding, but I appreciate him. He has walked with us every step of the way and been faithful and has helped us as we have tried to implement to make this affordable so anybody and everybody can be a part of it. We want to thank you for your support here at Bethesda. We want to we want to we want to give you a hand and thank you because I know you pray, I know you 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 are encouragement, you are behind those that have labored. A lot of you wives have sat while your husbands have gone Tuesday and Thursday nights. Um, and then worked in other areas of the church as well. And I want you to know you are greatly appreciated, and we love you, and we thank God for you. God bless you today. Shake hands, be friendly, hug somebody. Let them know you are glad to be in the house of the Lord.